your expectation. All right? So that's the first word. Write it in the blank. The word expectation. And expectations apply to does it pencil? And they really apply to anything and everything that you will ever be involved with for the rest of your natural life in sales, decision making, and persuasion. The first thing that you must, you must, you must do if you work in a consultant or a brokerage capacity with a client is to understand what is that client's expectation. And sometimes they're not going to know. That happens too. And as their advisor, you should know enough about what's going in the market as well as the different metrics in the market, which we will talk about in here, to be able to guide that discussion. I have been researching this, teaching it, and using it for the last 20 years. And I start with this because of everything I will ever talk to you about under the banner of sales persuasion and decision making, this is number one. This is Salesperson 101. This is Human Influence 101, Negotiation 101. People think th something's a good deal if it beats their expectations. So your job is figure out the expectations first. That's my first point. My second point is this. I've been doing this all my career. I've been doing this kind of work for myself, for clients, and as an instructor for a long time. And I've done the classroom work, the practical work, the master's degree, the CCIM, all that kind of stuff. And I have kind of come to the metaphorical full circle. And what I have learned in my life is that there are three things that you have to know how to do to understand value. Okay, so you guys were talking this morning about, I hear the word all the time, value, 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 right? Well, value, shmalu, what does that really mean, okay? When we look at investing, and when we look at investments, there are three ways to measure value. Now, before I tell you what these are, I want to emphasize something. The difference between two words, and the two words are should and must. I could do four hours on this, and I won't. But here's the basic point. There's things that we all sort of should do in life, and then there's things we must do. And we always do our musts and not our shoulds. <coughs> so I want you to start right now and absorb what I'm going to share with you next under the banner of must. So the first thing that you must know how to do is this, and you can fill in the blank, appreciation. You must understand how to do appreciation. We do appreciation in the course with the financial calculator. I'll show you some software stuff at the end of the day. And the methodology that we use, and you can write this down, it's an acronym of three letters. T, V, <laughs> oh, good one, nice save. <laughs> as long as everybody's looking at me, I'm not gonna do it. T, V, M, time value of money. You can't do, oh, she got it for you, bless. You can't do time value of money in your head. You have to have a financial calculator. If you are going to work with investors, if you are going to be an investor, this is a skill set that you must have. I'm very strong about this. I've been doing this a long time. And these clients, they have a certain expectation of us that we actually know what we're doing. So I'm going to just kind of draw the line right now. If you don't know how to do time value of money and you work with investors, you need to stop what you're doing and learn how to do this. It's just the way it is. All right. So that's number one. Here comes number two. Two words, cash flow. You must know how to measure the cash flow of an asset. So within cash flow, here are three different bullet point notes that you can make right now. Bullet point number one, A pod, A P O D. A P is in Paul, O is in Oscar, D is in David, A pod. And I'll tell you what that means there, I have to write down right now. But 
you have to know how to do an A pod. And it's just an income and spend sheet. It's pretty simple. Second thing you have to know how to do is something called cash on cash. Cash on cash does not measure ROI. Cash on cash measures ROE, return on equity investment. And the third of three things you have to understand, especially in real estate, is something called a Schedule E. Schedule E is in Edgar. We'll talk about that today. So I'm just going to kind of press pause there right now. What's the last bullet point again? Schedule E. You know, when I started my little sermon here, I said, there are three things you have to know how to do. So far, I've talked about two of them. And I want to pause here for just a second. Appreciation is not cash flow, and cash flow is not appreciation. They are separate. So one of the things I've got to just start telling you right now is you need to start shifting your point of view and understanding that now we're going back to expectations, which also link to objectives. What are you trying to do? Are you a fix and flip person, or are you a buy and hold person? Two completely different decisions, two completely different properties, two completely different results. And there is no reason that you should be fumbling through those conversations if you know what to ask on the front end. Okay. Here comes number three. One word. And the word is combination. And the combination is, in fact, the combination of the appreciation and the cash flow. So think about this. You are looking at buying a duplex, all right? And you're thinking to yourself, well, I'm going to hold this thing for five years, okay? So as you think about the five-year hold, rents are going to go up, you're going to have some vacancies, taxes are going to go up, you know, the market value might go down, it might go up, you're going to reduce debt. It's a very dynamic situation. It's not static, okay? So Cash flow and appreciation occur simultaneously over a time horizon, right? So the combination is a methodology that allows us to capture both of those in the context of an investment hold, right? So to do that one, the third one, here comes your abbreviation, it's something called IRR. And IRR stands for Internal Rate of Return. So I've been lecturing IRR for a long time, a lot of places, a lot of rooms, all over the country and half the world. And what I've learned as an instructor is IRR is something a lot of people have like heard about, but nobody really understands what it is. And some people use it, most people don't. I am here today to help you be more professional, to help you to make value a verb. I love that one. You can say to a client, this is what I can do for you. Your ability to sit down and analyze a property and do internal rate of return will differentiate you from most of your competition, except for the people in the room, obviously. Okay? So this is something you know how to do. So if you've heard about it, you're like, oh, well, it's way too advanced for me. No, it's not. It's actually quite simple. You just have to do it a few times. And I'm really good at teaching it. To do internal rate of return, you need something called a T account. T is in Tom, T account. So these three boxes, these are sort of the three pillars of Does It Pencil. You have to understand what appreciation is and how to measure it, cash flow, and the combination. And if you can do that, I swear to you, you can analyze any decision about any investment you will ever make in anything for the rest of your natural life. It's true. And I have 31 years of experience doing this. And if I didn't really believe it, I obviously wouldn't say it. And I'm just repeated time and time and time again that this is what you need to know how to do, okay? Now, I'm going to just take a quick sidebar and then come back to the bottom of page three. I think it's important in this conversation for all of us to remember 
what the nature, especially in real estate, of the decision-making process is in the transaction of real estate. So if you climb up that metaphorical 50,000-foot ladder and you look down on the landscape, here's what you see, and you guys already know this. It's a series of if-then, 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 if-then questions. And if you continue to pass go and collect $200, to use a phrase, you get to the end. And at the end, only one of two things ever happens because only one of two things can ever happen. You either buy it or you don't, and you either sell it or you don't. Decisions are binary. You either do or you don't. Like that little Yoda guy in Star Wars, there is no try, only do or do not. It's the same deal, right? Well, Yoda was a pretty smart little dude. And I think that's very important for me to inject right now into this conversation because this stuff can get really heavy. Everybody's kind of got a different skill set and so forth. But just don't forget, what are you trying to do with all this stuff? You're trying to make the right decision.